hello welcome to another video in this video we are going to be looking at the the fifth no the, the seventh topic of the jam syllabus which is um, nutrition now for this topic we would still continue with our book explicit biology and let's quickly begin so we are going to be looking at the mode of nutrition we are going to consider plant nutrition and then we we'll look at animal nutrition. This video might be in two parts, depending on the time. So if I, if I'm able to cover everything in one stretch, then it will be one video. But if not, then I will divide this video into two parts. So first and foremost, what is nutrition? It is the process by which organisms obtain and use nutrients required for maintaining life. And of course, these um, nutrients are used to provide to produce um, chemical energy in the form of ATP. Now, nutrient could be in the, in the form of organic nutrient, which is the nutrient that contains carbon. Example, you have carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Or inorganic nutrient, usually this contains uh, molecules and ions, such as um, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and of course, nitrate ion. So those are the two um, types of nutrient. Now let us look at the mode of nutrition. Now when you talk about the mode of nutrition, nutrition generally is divided into two types. One is called the autotrophic nutrition and you have the heterotrophic nutrition. So but let's look at this table. For autotrophic nutrition, the organisms are able to prepare their own food using energy from the environment, either in the form of sunlight or in the form of inorganic chemicals. So this energy is then converted into carbohydrates. For example, uh, plants and some other bacteria. So these organisms are called autotrophs and they are also referred to as producers because they can, man they can produce their own food using energy. Now, for phototrophic, autotrophic nutrition, it could be phototrophic and it could also be chemo-autotrophic. When it is autotrophic, I mean, when it is phototrophic, then it means that the organism in question are able to produce food using sunlight by a process called photosynthesis. And that require that the plant or the organism in question would have chlorophyll, which is the, um, the cell component that can harness the energy of the sunlight to produce carbohydrate. And for chemoautotroph, they, the source of energy for their own production of food is from the oxidation of chemicals in their environment. For example, you have methane bacteria and also you have sulfur bacteria. These bacteria can produce carbohydrate from sulfur and also for methane bacteria, they can produce carbohydrate from methane. Now let's look at heterotrophic nutrition. In the case of heterotrophic nutrition, the organisms feed on autotrophs because they cannot produce their own food. And in this case, it could be holozoic. In holozoic nutrition, that involves the injection of liquid and solid organic material and digestion and absorption takes place within the body and then the nutrient is utilized. Example, you have the protozoan and 99% of animals are holozoic. Now, what, is, what you should remember about holozoic nutrition is that digestion, absorption and assimilation takes place within the body. Now, for saprophytic nutrition, this is also called lysotrophic nutrition. Now, in this case, the organism feed on dead and decaying organic matter. They are usually called the decomposers. Now you have parasitic nutrition, whereby one organism live on the surface or inside the body of another organism and then derive nutrients directly from the organism without giving anything back. So we have example here, tenia, and you have the liver fluke. Now we have what is, what is called mixotrophic. Mixotrophic is actually another word for mutualistic um, nutrition whereby two organisms rely on each other for food and they benefit mutually so examples you have symbiodium which is found on coral 
For that example, let's look at the book again. Another example will be the um, carnivorous plant. So first, one thing you should know about carnivorous plants is that they are found, they grow in soil that is poor in nitrogen. So these um, carnivorous plants have developed structures that can help them to trap uh, insects or other smaller animals that come to feed. So when these in insects are attracted, then they are trapped in. For example, you have the Ven Venus fly trap, you have the sundew, you have the pitcher plant, and you have the, the bladder wart. So that concludes our talk on the mode of nutrition. Now let us look at one of them in detail, which is the process of photosynthesis. Of course, photosynthesis use light energy from sunlight as their external source of energy. And um, I mean, the process of photosynthesis use sunlight. And then this um, is usually the most common mode of nutrition in plant using the chlorophyll. So the process of photosynthesis is divided into two stages. You have what is called the light stage and um, what you call the, the dark stage. Now, both of them take place in the chloroplast, but for the light stage, it occurs in a structure called the thylakoid membrane, while the, the dark stage takes place in the part of the chloroplast, which is called the, the stroma. Now, I'm going to explain further this process using this illustration here. All right, so um, what happens in the light state of photosynthesis is that water is split to produce hydrogen by a process called photolysis. Now, when hydrogen is split, the hydrogen ion that is produced goes into the thylakoid and a process called photophosphorylation takes place. In this process of photophosphorylation, ATP is produced and NADPH is produced. The end product of the light phase or the light state of um, photosynthesis is oxygen, which is released back into the atmosphere. Now, going to the dark stage of um, photosynthesis, let me quickly go back to the to, to explicit biology. Now, in the dark stage, this is what happens. You have the enzyme, which is called Rubisco, which catalyzes the reaction. And what happens? So this reaction can be called carboxylation or carbon fixation. Now, in this case, carbon dioxide is added and it gives a six carbon intermediate compound which instantly split into two molecules of glycerate three phosphate which is called gp and a carbon compound so the gp is then phosphorylated the process of phosphorylation means um, a phosphate group is added using the atp that is produced from the light phase and then it is then reduced to glycer or the I3 phosphate, which is called GAP. Now this reaction uses up the NADPA that was produced and the ATP that were produced in the light phase of photosynthesis. Now let us go back to the illustration. So I've mentioned that Rubisco is the catalyst for this reaction this dark phase is called carbon fixation. So the ATP here that is produced in the light phase, just follow this table, and the NADP is produced in the light phase, goes into this Calvin circle and convert this compound into a cis carbon molecule in the presence of a catalyst called Rubisco. 
Now, when this cis carbon molecule is, form, is formed, it quickly splits down into three carbon molecule and um, GP3, glycerodiatri phosphate. So, the glycerodiatri phosphate is then further converted when three carbon molecule is added to produce a cis carbon molecule which is our glucose so this is the end product of the dark phase of photosynthesis i think that is very straightforward now let's go back to the book explicit biology then we we talk about mineral nutrients so mineral nutrients are the inorganic matter or chemicals in the soil that are released during the weathering of rocks they can be grouped into what you call the macronutrient and the micronutrient. So the micronutrients are also called the trace element. So what, what I used to do as a student is to just remember the macronutrient. So when I see questions that borders on identify which of this is not a micronutrient or a, a macronutrient, you can tell. So you don't need to remember all of these nutrients. Just know which is micro and then you can you can tell that the rest is macro or micro sorry so for example you have um, sodium potassium phosphorus nitrogen calcium sulfur and magnesium as the macronutrient all right so and how do you remember this sodium is um, na that's the 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 symbol all right so na and potassium is uh, k and this is uh, p phosphorus is p remember the fertilizer called npk right so it means it contains um, also sorry nitrogen so this is the 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 fertilizer called npk contains nitrogen phosphorus and potassium so that tells you the importance of that fertilizer so it contains major nutrients so if you remember mpk which is nitrogen phosphorus and potassium then you can add all of this again phosphorus calcium sulfur and magnesium now magnesium for example is the element found in chlorophyll so you can see how important this is as well so that helps you to then um, remember the macronutrient and this table shows the, the function and deficiency symptoms of these um, mineral nutrients. So you should be able to remember that nitrogen plays a key role in protein formation and amino acid formation. The same thing with phosphorus and potassium. So phosphorus is important for nucleic acid and ATP formation and um, potassium is a catalyst and also an ion is required for ion transport so to wrap up this chapter let us look at experiment in photosynthesis so usually how do we know that photosynthesis has taken place usually um, when photosynthesis occur the end product is glucose which is further converted into starch starch is the product that can be tested so when you test for starch you are confirming whether photo photosynthesis has taken place or not and you to confirm the presence of starch you use iodine when iodine is added you can read the steps in the process of confirmation testing for starch when um, for a positive test you wish um, the test will show a blue black col coloration and when you are testing for starch in leaf, the first thing you do is to boil the leaf in order to kill the cells. You boil the leaf in water to kill the cells. And when you then boil in alcohol, 70% alcohol is to decolorize the plant. Okay, and then you soften in water before you add iodine. And if it turns blue black, it means that photosynthesis has taken place and glucose has been formed which has been then converted into starch. Other, exam other experiments under photosynthesis that are very important is the experiment to demonstrate that 
uh, carbon dioxide is necessary. And how do you do that? You conduct an experiment where in one case, uh, carbon dioxide would not be possible to be supplied to the plant. And in the other case, carbon dioxide will be present. So in this case, if you absorb carbon dioxide using um, potassium hydroxide, carbon dioxide will not be here and carbon dioxide will be here. So at the end of the day, this will not turn blue black. Why this will turn blue black? That's just the rationale. Another experiment you can use to demonstrate that light is essential in photosynthesis. So that is also another straightforward experiment whereby you can cover um, plant or you can, you can grow a plant in the dark and another plant is exposed to sunlight. And then when you test for starch, only the plant exposed to sunlight will actually um, turn blue black. Why the plant in the dark will not turn blue black? And that shows that light is essential for photosynthesis. Another one that shows that the green area, that they demonstrate that only green areas of leaf can photosynthesize. In this case, you use what you call a variegated leaf. So it's the same experiment as, as testing for starch, but what is different here? You are using leaves that has other colors on their surface. So in that case, by the time you test for starch, only the green area would respond because the, it's the green area that has chlorophyll, while the other plant would not. So you use a variegated plant for that experiment. And I think finally, experiment to demonstrate that oxygen is given off during photosynthesis. How do you do that? You use a water plant or a water weed called Elodia, for example. So the typical setup is this. You have the plant here, you have a, an inverted funnel, and then the gas that is collected here would be oxygen. So and how do you test for oxygen? Oxygen would always rekindle a glowing splint. So when you take up, take off this test tube that is turned upside down and you insert a glowing splint, glowing splint, it reignites and that tells you that oxygen has been produced. So it's an interesting uh, photosynthesis and the experiments, they are very interesting topic to, to study. Then I'll quickly wrap up in the interest of time uh, to look at some questions. So let's take, for example, question number two here, which is UME 1970, question 17. The mode of nutrition in which digestion is extracellular is Remember what I told you about um, Olozoic, digestion happens within. Parasitic, it depends. Digestion could be inside or outside. But um, the, core, the real answer to this question here will be saprophyte. And that has been explained in the book. So in saprophytic, uh, saprophytes usually digest their substrate outside their body before absorption then takes place. And this digestion outside is called extracellular digestion. So another example, um, okay, another question. Fungi are heterotrophic because, why, do, why are they heterotrophic? Of course, because they lack chlorophyll, all right? So they have to, they cannot manufacture their own food. So let's look at this question. Mode of nutrition in Nitrobacter, Ascaris, and Homo sapiens, respectively. Homo sapiens are humans. So humans carry out what? Olozoic nutrition. So look at look for Olozoic first. So we have these three options staring at us in the face. Now we can then um, eliminate further. So uh, Ascaris is our um, round one in the intestine, which is a parasite. So parasitic nutrition. Let's look for parasitic. This is correct. This is out. So our option is between A and B. And then finally, uh, Nitrobacter. Nitrobacter is a chemosynthetic uh, plant, sorry, and that means they can they they don't use sunlight, but they use chemical in the environment. Okay, so uh, I think I've spent a lot of time on this already. Um, I'm going to stop here. In the next video, I would complete this um, section. I will look at. Um, I'm going to look at. Um, mode of, I mean, nutrition in animals. So before then, you can like, you can subscribe, you can give me comments in the comment section and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.